Hello and welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast and our mini-series of our deep dive into D Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Today we're kept covering chapters 38 and 39, in which a couple of minor plot points happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow, we get a big plot twist here. I knew what was coming. I just wasn't sure when and I couldn't remember the details. Like I said, it's been a while since I've read it. But wow, it, it's just was fresh and shocking, even knowing it was coming. So again, we're uh, going to discuss chapters 38 and 39 today, and I would love to get your response to these chapters. If you uh, knew, were you completely floored? Does this twist even make sense to you? Before we even get any farther into this, I do have to warn that we have some major spoilers coming for these chapters. So if you have not read the chapters, for whatever reason, uh, I don't know why you'd be watching this if you haven't read them already, but go and read them. Come back and watch this video, okay? Because it's pretty amazing. I'm gushing. We should just get into this because there's a lot to unpack here. So grab your copy of Great Expectations and let's dive into Dickens. We begin chapter 38 with the uh, promised chapter about Estella. And we find that Pip is literally haunting uh, her home. And I like his descriptions that if someday he, when he dies and becomes a, and if he becomes a ghost, he'd, he'd surely end up just haunting the house that she used to live in. And that, uh, you know, and that his spirit is there haunting uh, that place. He continues to be treated miserably and feel miserable in Estella's presence. She uses him to make other men jealous and she torments the other men. And it says that he says this about, spending time with her. He says, I suffered every kind and degree of torture that Estella could cause me. The nature of my relations with her, which placed me on terms of familiarity without placing me on terms of favor, conduced my distraction. She made use of me to tease other admirers, and she turned the very familiarity between herself and me to the account of putting a constant slight on my devotion to her. And then it goes on to say how it, it maddens him. And ends up concluding that he says, I never had one hour's happiness in her society, and yet my mind all round the four and twenty hours was harping on the happiness of having her with me unto death. You know, why, Pip? <laughs> why? He She makes him miserable, and he says she, he never had an hour's happiness in her society, and yet he longed for the day when they could be together forever. Okay, you got me. This is probably one of the biggest questions of this book that I don't know if I understand. You know, we've talked about how he views Estella and why he would be attracted to her and want her, and he thinks that she is part of his inheritance, you know, his expectations, that he idolizes her for all these things that she probably represents to him, but he's unhappy in her presence. He's treated miserably she warns him away and i just don't get it <laughs> why he is so obsessed with estella and i've never thought that deeply about that relationship before until this current time i'm reading and it's really starting to not make sense to me not not that dickens isn't writing it well because i think he is but i i i'm just i'm not getting pip's motivation here and i can't really say more than that without spoilers for what's to come. So we're going to just put that aside for now. And that, that's going to be something we'll talk about at the end of the novel. Uh, but that's just the big question I have in my head is, Pip, why are you so obsessed with her? And I know we've answered that again, but I, I just, I don't know. We'll see if it gets explained. Oh, I do also want to point out that uh, Estella, again, gives him warning that he should uh, be careful of her and stay away from her uh, about how she treats men. He makes this interesting comment that she knew that she could not choose but obey Miss Havisham. So again, we have that um, idea that our fates, their fates are being controlled, their destinies are being controlled by someone else. Uh, put a pin in that until chapter 39, because goodness. <laughs> so Estella and Pip go and visit Miss Havisham, and... Miss Havisham, again, is acting her usual creepy, weird way. She asks Pip, you know, how is she treating you? How is she treating you? And 
well, not well, you know, let's be honest. So Pip realizes this truth. He says, I saw in this that Estella was so, was set to wreak Miss Havisham's revenge on men and that she was not to be given to me until she had gratified it for a term. Okay, he's at least partly right. She, she's been bred and created to wreak revenge on men. Uh, and, and, and she is a monster of Miss Havisham's creation. And I'm getting Frankenstein vibes here, which I'll explain more in a minute. And Pip still thinks, okay, once she's done wreaking havoc on men, then she'll be mine. Pip, you, you poor, sweet cinnamon roll of a boy. No, 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 no. <laughs> so Miss Havisham and Estella are sitting by the fire and Estella begins to withdraw from Miss Havisham. And she says, you know, basically calls her out and says, why are you being so cold towards me? And Estella says this. What, said Estella, preserving her attitude of indifference as she leaned against the great chimney piece and only moving her eyes. Do you reproach me for being cold? You? Are you not? Was the fierce retort. You should know, said Estella. I am what you have made me. Take all the praise. Take all the blame. Take all the success. Take all the failure. In short, take me. And anyway, this ongoing discussion and argument really between the two of them, Miss Havisham and Estella, where Miss Havisham is offended that Estella was treating her coldly. And Estella is basically saying, I am who you made me to be. So don't be surprised when I treat you that way. You know, she says, who taught me to be proud? Who praised me when I learned my lesson? And then later she says, I must be taken as I have been made. The success is not mine. The failure is not mine. But the two together make me. There's a scene in the novel Frankenstein where the monster responds in anger towards Dr. Frankenstein and, and gives him the, the um, did I did I request thee to make me speech? You know, that I think he gets it from uh, Paradise Lost. And... I always found that to be a powerful moment that this man created a monster. And when the monster does what monsters do, he gets shocked and appalled. And, you know, and the monster is basically like, I didn't ask to be made this way. You made me this way. And so now we're getting the same thing here. I think Miss Havisham has created Estella to be this ice cold, revengeful creature, incapable of love and affection. And then Miss Havisham is shocked when Estella treats her that way. But Estella says, you made me this way. I think this is a big moment in their relationship. That maybe Miss Havisham is beginning to realize, what have I done? Uh, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll see more of what comes in the following chapters. It could be that she is beginning to regret her decisions? I, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. So while they're arguing, Pip goes for a walk. He comes back and suddenly everything is calm. Everything is as it was. And there's no mention of the argument. And it's kind of weird. But at, but at least things are calmed down now. After this, Pip goes to the, uh, the Finches Club where they're having dinner. And uh, Bentley Drummel, the spider, is there. And he makes a toast to... A woman he's courting named Estella. And Pip is shocked and says, you know, Estella, who are you talking about? And realizes he's talking about his Estella, the one we all know. And he basically challenges him to a duel. If I could afford the clip, I would insert here the 10 Duel Commandments song from Hamilton. OK, because that, I mean, that is that's a great summary of of the, the rules of, of dueling, although I believe at this time in England, that was considered, uh, still considered illegal, but it was still the way that gentlemen would settle their differences. So Pip is basically calling him out for lying and saying, unless you provide proof, we're, we're going to, we're going to fight. But then Drummel does, uh, provide a letter that Estella wrote him and proves that he, what he was talking about is true. Estella and Pip talk, and he's basically asking why. You know, why are you doing this? Why would you want to hang out with somebody like Drummel? He realizes, I think, that she is going to try to, like a spider, 
herself, she is going to try to trap and ensnare him, Dremel, and enact revenge upon him as Mrs. Havisham's proxy, you know, because that's what she's trained Estella to do, is to break the hearts of men, to just like some man has broken her heart. And then we get this interesting exchange between Estella and Pip right near the end. He says, I have seen you give him looks and smiles this very night, such as you never give to to me. You know, maybe he's a little jealous. He's saying, Why are you you're treating him in such a way that you don't treat me that way? And she says, Do you want me then? said Estella, turning suddenly with a fixed and serious, if not angry, look, to deceive and entrap you. Do you deceive and entrap him, Estella? Yes, and many others. All of them but you. Now this could be why she keeps warning him away. That she does pick and torment on Pip, but it's different than even the way she's treating these others. And I'm wondering if maybe somewhere deep inside of her, she does have some authentic feelings for Pip. And she doesn't, in the end, want to hurt him permanently in the way that she is planning to hurt others or that Miss Havisham has planned to use her to hurt others. And then uh, we get the closing of the chapter of chapter 38 with the hint and description that a big thing is coming. Okay, he, Pip uses uh, the story from, uh, I believe it's from the tale, Tales of the Genie, which I think, are those part of the Arabian Night stories? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, basically, he uses the story to describe how he feels like there's this giant stone hanging above him and somebody's just cut the rope and and it's coming and boy howdy is it coming here's what i love about dickens he is telling you a plot twist is coming okay a big thing is coming he's warning you ahead of time and yet it's still shocking to read i mean i read it chapter 39 and was still just amazed at its his mastery of deception at least I was deceived the first time I read it. And I, I, again, I would be interested to know if if you also were thinking, uh, were surprised by this twist that's coming, but I keep hinting at it. So let's just get into it. So that was part 23, uh, published on May 4th, 1861. So now another week you have to wait to find out what's going on. I love imagining what the Victorian readers, how they might've been hanging on the edge of their seats, you know, this could have been like a great cliffhanger. Uh, 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 think of some of your sh- your favorite TV shows that might have had a, a cliffhanger or a movie that might have ended on a cliffhanger and you're just waiting and waiting to see how it will be resolved. I'm really catching that uh, that fervor of just being in the moment of the story. And I'm not trying to think too far ahead with what I can remember and what I can't. I'm just going with it. and it's And it's so fun because this really, I think, pays off. And we're left with a big question answered, but in the answering of that, it has, it has brought up so many other questions, and I love that. So let's go ahead and uh, keep going uh, to part 24, chapter 39, and we'll see where exactly Pip has gotten his income from. So about two years have passed since he came into his expectations at the age of 21, so he's 23, and Basically, Dickens takes about a page and a half to to say it was a dark and stormy night. And already the uh, the atmosphere is set. It is moody. It is dark. It is windy. It is rainy. It actually reminds me a lot of the weather we've been having uh, here in Iowa this week or, or last night, especially. It was it was a doozy of a storm that came through. So Pip and Herbert have been living together sharing uh, rooms off and on over the last few years and um, Herbert is is out of town at the moment and Pip is home late at night reading in the storm I mean this sounds like this sounds great honestly actually this is what I was doing last night (laughs) I was home alone well I wasn't alone but I was home reading while the storm around me raged outside and, and yeah it was it was fun but then suddenly he hears footsteps on the stairs I like this quote, uh, just at one of the descriptions of the, the the storm, it says this, that 
The smoke came rolling down the chimney as though it could not bear to go out into such a night. <laughs> so like, I like how Dickens personifies things like that. And uh, it was so windy that even the smoke didn't want to go outside. Uh, so you really get a picture of just how boisterous the storm is and what a, you know, example of what is going on and about to go on in Pip's life here. And then we get a description of this stranger coming up the stairs and it so reminds me of the Marley's ghost scene in A Christmas Carol. And so, yes, I can find another another way to bring everything back to A Christmas Carol. It says, I read with my watch upon the table, purposing to close my book at 11 o'clock. As I shut it, St. Paul's and all the many church clocks in the city, some leading, some accompanying, some following, struck the hour. The sound was curiously flawed by the wind, and I was listening and thinking how the wind assailed and tore it when I heard a footstep on the stair. What nervous folly made me start, and awfully connect it with the footstep of my dead sister matters not. It was past in a moment, and I listened again and heard the footstep stumble in coming on. Remembering then that the staircase lights were blown out, I took up my reading lamp and went out to the stairhead. Whoever was below had stopped on seeing my lamp, for all was quiet. So uh, quite a, a tense description of of this character coming up the stairs and Pip wondering, okay, what's going on? Pip invites him to come up. And he's catching glimpses of him in the dark lighting. Uh, the, the man comes in, sits by the fire. And then suddenly Pip says, I knew him. If the wind and the rain had driven away the intervening years, had scattered all the intervening objects, had swept us to the churchyard where we first stood face to face on such different levels, I could not have known my convict more distinctly than I knew him now, as he sat in the chair before the fire. No need to take a file from his pocket and show it to me. No need to take the handkerchief from his neck and twist it round his head. No need to hug himself with both his arms and take a shivering turn across the room looking back at me for recognition. I knew him before he gave me one of those aids, though a moment before I had not been conscious of remotely suspecting his identity. Okay, so here's another shock then. Oh, it's the convict is back. You know, if you're reading this for the first time, you're thinking, okay, this is shocking. But then as they're, you know, catching up, the convict begins to hint at and realize and slowly reveal to Pip that he was in fact the one who gave him pip his expectations and at this point it's like you know mind blown uh insert clip of david Tennant's doctor who saying what 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 <laughs> you just sit there and marvel at how dickens has played you and played with our expectations as it were that pip spent all this time thinking that Miss Havisham was the one who gave him his finances, but instead it was a convict that Pip has spent his life trying to get away from his past and trying to get away from the convict. And it turns out the convict has been the one controlling his destiny all this time. And the convict says this. Yes, Pip, dear boy, I've made a gentleman on you. It's me what has done it. I swore that time, sure as ever I earned a guinea. That guinea should go to you. I swore afterwards, should, sure as ever I speculated and got rich, you should get rich. I lived rough, that you should live smooth. I worked hard, that you should be above work. What odds, dear boy? Do I tell it for you to feel an obligation? Not a bit. I tell it for you to know, as that there hunted dung, dunghill dog, what you kept in life, got his head so high that he could make a gentleman. And Pip, you're him. I mean, this has completely just unraveled Pip's brain, you know, uh, they continue to talk and, and Pip is just floored and he's getting all these answers from, uh, from the convict, uh, and, and the convict's going to spend the night there, uh, in Pip's place. But he, he says that we need to be cautious because he was supposed to be in Australia, you know, where they ship convicts to, he earned his riches there being a, a sheep farmer, herder, whatever you call him, <laughs> you know, and now he's come back. But to come back is to face the death sentence. So he's got to be there secretly. 
Pip is in a bind because now he's again associating with a convict, aiding and abetting a criminal. And he's trying to sleep, but he can't. And he has this thought. He says, Miss Havisham's intentions towards me, all a mere dream. Estella not designed for me. I only suffered inside his house as a convenience. A sting for the greedy relations, a model with a mechanical heart to practice on when no other practice was at hand. Those were the first smarts I had, but sharpest and deepest pain of all. It was for the convict, guilty of I knew not what crimes, and liable to be taken out of those rooms where I sat thinking and hanged at the old Bailey door that I had deserted Joe. So Pip is gutted, and he realizes that he has deserted Joe for this convict, that he had all these dreams about what Miss Havisham would do for him and what uh, and a, a marriage and a life with Estella when it turns out they just used him because he was a convenient person nearby. They used him for Estella to practice on. And for all of these false things, all of these heartbreaking things and, and reasons, Pip left Joe. And now he says, now I can't go back. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we We are just left with our jaws on the floor by the end of this chapter. Pip can hardly sleep, gets up early, and the next day it is storming even worse than it was the day before. And uh, yeah, the, this weather has a personality for sure. So first of all, uh, Charles Dickens, you you master genius mad writer, you. <laughs> what, what, a, what a great plot twist. The thing that's really sticking out to me now is that we have Pip, who is being, who is being created into a gentleman as kind of a way to, I don't know if it's seek revenge or to stick it to the man or whatever that this convict is trying to do. Like he is living through Pip that he was mistreated by gentlemen. Maybe, you know, he was poor and destitute and overlooked by everyone and no one helped him. So he's going to take somebody from his similar class background, perhaps, and turn him into a gentleman as a way of mocking other gentlemen. I, I mean, I think that's what he's doing. Then we have Estella, who is also being created by Miss Havisham to enact revenge upon uh, men who had hurt Miss Havisham. So it's like we have these two people who are being controlled by other people who are trying to, for whatever purposes, make a statement or... or enact revenge or operate through somebody else. And in the end, that makes me sad because Pip realizes I have wasted my life. I, I have wasted, you know, I have turned my back on a good man for reasons, for terrible reasons, for reasons that I, w I was even wrong about, for promises of things that I would never get. I've been used and his whole life has been, has been, turned upside down now and and he's just left on the floor of his house of his home wondering what to do next that brings us to the end of part 24 it brings us to the conclusion of book two and we're going to take the next week off now to kind of recover and to catch up on the reading if you haven't caught up although i'm assuming if you're watching this you've caught up so hello thank you good to have you along it, this has been fun. I, I say it again, and I'll say it over and over again. This has been a fun read. And I want to thank you for coming along with me uh, and the interaction you, you all are given uh, on these videos and in the chat and different things like that. So thank you for that. If I don't see you again next week, it will definitely be back in two weeks as we begin the concluding book of Great Expectations. We'll see what happens with Pip and all that all those who are acquainted with him and uh, see where Pip ends up at the end. Um, if this is your first time reading, um, you're in for a treat. Uh, some, some, some great story writing coming. So hang in there. Uh, keep reading. And until next time, I hope you are well. Happy reading, everyone, and take care.